Hello, this is Lon Safko, author of the Social Media Bible here for Extreme Digital Marketing. And we're talking part of the uh, creative, uh, the innovative thinking, creative thinking uh, solution uh, series here. And this is, hey, right brain, wake up. And in this presentation, what I want to talk about is creativity and how the right brain, the left brain works and how you can become more creative, more uh, innovative, how you can get your teams, your people, your staff, uh, the people around you to be more creative and how the different parts of the brain work, the difference between right and left brain. So I think this is fun. I think you're going to enjoy this. is This is something that I have a serious passion for. I just love the innovative, the creative side. And the reason that this is part of extreme digital marketing, even though it's not exactly extreme digital marketing, it is marketing. I can give you the best tools on the planet. I can give you a brand new saw and I can give you a hammer and nails and and all the tools that you need to build a house and I can give you a pile of wood but you know what you're not gonna build that house or if you're going if you do build it it's gonna be crappy because you've never done it before you gotta have some creativity some innovation you gotta have a little bit of architecture in you in addition to just having the right tools so for me having the right tools are incredibly important but having very innovative and creative ways to use those tools I think is even more important so that's what this series is all about so hey right brain wake up 10 ways to jump start your ideas okay did that wake you up all right, left brain versus right brain. You know, truly and honestly, you hear that all the time and people kind of make light of it, the right brain, left brain, you're using your left brain. Well, you know, it's really true how people think and which side of the brain they think predominantly with. Now, the left side of your brain is analytical. It deals with numbers. It deals with text. Um, it deals with um, uh, balancing your checkbook, how calculating how you're going to get to work, walking up and down the stairs, it, it really, and it also runs protecting you, stepping off the curb but doing the calculation on the car that's coming down the road, whether or not you're going to make it, or whether or not the sign is flashing properly, or whether or not you're going to clear that red light. All those calculations are all done on the left side of your brain. The right side of your brain is the creative side. It's the concept side. That's where art is created. That's where music is created. That's where inspiration comes from. That's where you see colors. Remember, colors are concepts. Uh, if I look at green and you look at green, are we actually seeing the same color? I mean, we've both been taught to identify that wavelength of light as green, but could it be different? Could that be the reason that different people prefer different colors? Some people prefer red. Some people's favorite color is blue. Some people's favorite color is uh, green. What if we actually all saw exactly the same color but we called it differently I mean think about that that's where the concept comes from now in order for inspiration for creative ideas for you to verbalize them for you to realize them for them to come from this right brain more or less unconscious uh, concept area to your conscious communicating area it has to be transferred from one side to the other and that's where we fail your right brain comes up with tons of great ideas but we never have a technique or a time or a process for allowing the right brain to communicate those incredible innovative creative con uh, concepts to the left side calculating analytical side of your brain so let's uh... they say only 10 percent of the brain's function is known apparently the function of the remaining 90 percent is to keep us from discovering its function now that was George Carlin and I, I love his, the way he looks at things. He uses both sides of his brain and he looks at things opposite. He looks at them from completely different angles. Both him and Stephen Wright are cerebral comedians, meaning that they'll take something that we all take for granted. Uh, like for example, uh, we only use 10% of our brain. So he came up with the concept, okay, if we only use 10% of our brain, what do we use the other 90% for? Well, it's obviously to keep us from discovering <laughs> the other 90%. So I love the way he thinks because it's different. It's 180 degrees. It's from the underneath. It's from the back side of things. Uh, completely different thinking. And that's what the way I want you to start to think as we go through this uh, creative, innovative process. Now, this actually is a uh, test for color blindness. So if you're colorblind, you know what, hit fast forward on the video because you're not going to be able to participate in this, um, this quiz. But I was looking at it at an optometrist's office one day, and all of a sudden I realized, understanding 
as well as I do the left brain, white, right brain uh, communications. And I thought, oh my gosh, and I came up with this little quiz here. Here's the deal. Um, it's three lists of words, and there's six words in each list. What I want you to do is I want you to start at the top left, and I want you to read all the words in all three columns as quickly as you can until you get to the end, as quickly as you can. But And you're going to do this two times for me. So here's the first thing that I want you to do. I want you to tell me the color, the name of the word. Just read the word. I'll give you an example. It's yellow, black, purple. And I want you to go as quickly as you can from the top left to the lower right. Okay, are you ready? Just read the list, read the words, tell me what the words say, ignore the color. Okay, here we go. Three, two, one, read. Okay, that was pretty good right that was pretty fast you did that really well okay now here comes the next test I want you to ignore what the word says but I just want you to tell me the colors just go down and say um, green yellow red as quickly as you can top left all the way down to the bottom right just like we did do it as quickly as you can here we go three two one go Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop you there because you're getting embarrassed. It's bad, isn't it? Yeah, I and and that's normal, by the way. That's perfectly okay. Here's why that happened. You, you, I bet you didn't anticipate it happening. The reason it happened that way is remember we're all predominantly left-brained, which is probably the reason we're all right-handed, uh, because it's the left side of your brain that handles the right side of your body and vice versa. But we're all predominantly left side. It's the part that keeps us alive. It's the analytical. It's the calculating side. When we deal with text, when we look at the Y E L L O W, we're doing two vowels go walking. The first one does the talking. Sometimes Y and W, except for the second month alone, which 28 we assign to leap year. I don't know all those rules. Those are all calculations. So we can read that list simply looking at the letters of the text and doing this left brain calculation and communication. We can do that relatively quickly. The moment we move to our right side of our brain, that handles concepts, colors, art. And then we have to get these concepts of the color green and the concept of the color yellow. And here's the tough part. Take those concepts and translate them, communicate them to the left side of our brain so that we can actually then verbally communicate those concepts is a really cumbersome process. And not many of us have that ability. Some of us do. If you did equally as well, my hat's off to you. That means you're as strong left brain as you are right brain, and you can probably sign your name with both hands. Most of us can't. So if when you started this video, if you didn't really believe that there was a significant difference between your right and left brain, uh, I think that this proves the case. It certainly did for me. So let's take a look at things that we can do to actually jumpstart our brain and to, and to become more creative and come up with good ideas. Brainstorming. I love brainstorming sessions. Oh man, they are just so much fun. Uh, and the reason is, give, let me give you an example. If you can get 10 people at the age of 40 in your room to brainstorm on a concept, you are, you've accumulated 400 years of human experience, 400 years of human experience that you can bring to solving your problem or creating your next solution. Isn't that amazing? That's why teams, when they're working properly, are so effective. So brainstorming sessions are awesome because what we see, what we look at, and again, check out some of the other creative videos and you'll see there's more on uh, how your brain works. When you can get all these different people with different perspectives, different life experiences in one room at one time, you are then bringing all of those different perspectives to try to solve that one problem. And that's why brainstorming is really effective. Now, that could be brainstorming with a team, your staff, your team. And you know what? If you're an entrepreneurial company, that just means maybe you, your wife, the one the kid down the street, your kids, or some of your business associates. You know other people that you respect their opinion. You know what? Buy a pizza one night and get together and brainstorm. That's the whole purpose. Hour and a half brainstorm. We're going to buy the pizza and the beer. So anything from a Fortune 500 official brainstorming session all the way down to pizza and beer. Idea mapping. If you're not familiar with idea mapping, that is, it, it's really cool. I mean, it's, it's it, mind mapping, they call, call it sometimes. Um, when you're done with this video, go to the internet and type in mind mapping. 
and uh, it was invented by a psychologist. He uh, he was some Great Britain back in the 60s, and it's been perfected. And there's a lot of companies that are doing it and sell consulting services. Basically, what you do is you say, okay, let's write the problem on a, a whiteboard, and we'll circle it, and then we'll say, let's write down everything we know that's a about that problem. What ideas and concepts can we come up with? And you write those around the initial word of what your problem is. Draw circles around them. Then take each one of those words and say, what do we know about that word? What are all the different concepts that we can come up with that has to do with that word? Now you write those out a little bit further and you draw circles around them and draw a line to the word. And what you end up with is all of this this environment, this whole landscape of concepts, now you can start drawing lines between the different concepts and it's amazing how ideas will jump out at that point. Absolutely amazing. And that's all part of mastering the art of idea capturing. And idea capturing sometimes could mean something as simple as putting a yellow pad next to your bed on your nightstand at night. How many people here here, honestly, by a show of hands, you can't see me, but I can see you. That's all part of this new social media technology. I want you to raise your hands. How many people here come up with their best ideas when they wake up in the middle of the night? Okay, okay. You in the back, put your hand back up. Okay, good. See, uh, look, at almost, I'd say more than half of everybody raised their hands. And how many of you, you, you can put your hands down, how many of you swear that because it was such a great idea that there's no way that you're going to forget it and that in the morning you're going to jump right on it and then in the morning you wake up and you say okay wait a minute I had a great idea last night I know it was great it was um, let me see a, a cure for cancer a cure for something what oh man what was it can of beans I, I don't know that's why I keep a yellow pad or actually a little sticky pad and a pen on uh, my nightstand. Um, so there's a lot of really, really great ideas that you come up with, but you got to capture them. If you come up with a good idea, grab your cell phone, call your cell phone number. You're not going to answer because you're talking on your cell phone and you'll get your voicemail and leave a message, leave that idea and then add after that, hey, you know, I saw you today. Uh, you're looking pretty good. You're looking a little younger. Did you lose some weight? So that when you get that message, you'll actually feel better because you'll capture your idea and then you'll get a compliment all in one voicemail. So capture it and figure out different ways that you can do that. I text message myself um, continuously every time I can. And what it does is it goes into my email so that I get a permanent record of it and I can't delete it. I have to follow through with it. So also another way of capturing and creating really good ideas is, is random words and thesaurus. If you go into Word, and I'm not kidding, this works. Go into Word and I want you to write down the title is whatever problem you're trying to solve. And then I want you to write down every single word that you can think of that's associated with that problem. Just write down words that you think are keywords. Let's suppose you were looking for a solution on the internet and you came up with the uh, keywords, as many keywords as you can that describes that problem. Now, go into the double click the word, go under the thesaurus, and then look at all the different words, copy and paste as many words as you can. Leave a couple of spaces between each of the uh, categories. Now go back and reread it. What will happen is the thesaurus will give you a different perspective, a different way, a different meaning, which is similar but not the same, which will also pull ideas. It will bring, it will spark your brain into coming up with new ideas. It really works. It, it, and it's a fun little exercise, especially if you do it with a group. And random picture or random websites. Um, I do this all the time. I mean, see the image at the top right. I typed in ten. Uh, I typed in jumpstart ideas because that's the name of this particular slide, and that's the image that I came up with in Google Image Jumpstart. Now, of course, I added ten ways to jumpstart ideas, but the whole jumpstart thing was there. I mean, isn't that cool? That gave me a different way of looking at it. I mean, I, honestly, I didn't think about automobile jumpstart. I should have. It probably could have. I was thinking of, you know, how do you get the creative juices flowing? But son of a gun, that's a great symbol for this particular frame. So go to Google Images and type in all of these different keywords and just Browse through the different images that come back. And I guarantee you, again, if you do the thesaurus first, then you do the Google images, uh, you're going to be amazed with the information that you find. And look at and type in websites too. Type in the keywords, keyword phrases for your problem and see what websites pop up. I mean, it, it, you, honestly, you'll be amazed and you'll be inspired. You'll be stimulated. 
and then search and reapply. You know, like just like the thesaurus, uh, it applies to coming up with solutions and and keep doing it. Keep it's a iterative process, meaning that go out, get some information, look at images. When you start looking at websites and images, it's going to give you ideas for some new keywords. Add those keywords back to your Word document check those keywords in the thesaurus and then take those combinations and go back out to the internet it's lather rinse and repeat get some ideas go look for images go into the thesaurus check websites get your results and then repeat the process again and challenge the facts just because you're absolutely sure that that's what the facts are you're wrong I mean you're wrong take a look at some of the other creative ones and look at the uh, nine dots and I may do it in this presentation, I'm not sure. Um, if we have time, I'll do it. Uh, but look at the nine dots. <clears throat> I mean, the number one fact is, is that too often we put restrictions and rules on ourselves that simply don't exist. We think that we're supposed to solve the problem a certain way. Don't put those restrictions. Challenge the facts. Just because on the surface you think it's true, you know what? It might not be true. So write down every fact that you know and then look at that from a perspective as, you know what? Maybe that's wrong. Maybe that's not true. And escape. You got to escape. You've got to get away from the pressure. You got to go out for a walk. You got to go to the zoo. You've, uh, yeah, I know. I, yeah, show the video to your boss and tell him you're going to the zoo because I said so. But you have to get away from doing the. Um, Einstein defined insanity as doing the same thing the same way and expecting different results. Einstein defined insanity as doing the same thing the same way and expecting different results. If you keep sitting at your desk, you keep doing the same thing, you're not going to come up with a diff different result. So you got to escape. And analogies. Um, I love analogies. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, Henry Ford. What was Henry Ford famous for? Okay, yeah, the Model T, but what, what really made the Model T famous? It was the assembly line. The assembly line was the most amazing invention that it ever ever hit the Industrial Revolution and what gave Henry Ford the ability to punch out a $450 car and I love uh, what Henry Ford says he says you can have it, the Model T you can have it in any color you want as long as it's black it was mass production he invented mass production up until then the car sat in one place and the 30 engineers would move around the car and build the one car and then move on to the next car. He came up with the idea of the assembly line where you had the 30 engineers but the car would move past the engineers and the engineers tools and parts and everything stayed stable. Makes sense? Well did he find that solution in the automobile industry? Well obviously not. He was the one that brought it to the automobile industry. Did could he uh, he could have gone over to the Oldsmobile brothers and asked them, well, they didn't have a solution. He could have went to uh, uh, the Chevrolet bicycle shop and asked them, but he didn't have any solutions. He could have uh, sent a wire uh, to Mercedes over in Germany working on uh, his their car uh, named after his daughter, but they didn't have those solutions. Nobody did. You know where Henry Ford found it? He was actually frustrated. He went out. He was sat under a tree, and he was eating his lunch on a potato farm in Michigan. And while he was sitting under the tree he was watching the truck the potatoes were going up this conveyor belt and dropping into the truck and when he saw it he instantly got this inspiration that instead of potatoes if they could be cars that he could mass produce cars faster and cheaper and he did and it was a huge success and it changed the way we manufacture analogies don't look for the solution in your industry. If it was there, you would have already known about it. It's not there. But I'll guarantee someone else has solved a similar solution uh, in a different industry. So widen your, your search. And then wishful thinking. If you could solve your problem, if you had no restrictions on money, no restrictions on any resources, human resources, financial resources, time resources, what would your solution look like? What would it be? What would be the perfect solution? Okay, so you know where you are on the left side of the scale. You now defined where you are on the right side of the scale, and you're absolutely guaranteed that your solution is somewhere along that scale. Now, once you have it categorized with the both endpoints, and you know it's somewhere in the middle, it's easier to find. Okay, right brain strategies. You got to stay positive. If you're stressed, if you're under stress, if you're angry, remember what happens when you're not positive, when you're in a negative frame of mind, when you're stressed, you are 
secreting adrenaline. Adrenaline induces what's called the fight or flight mechanism. You want to fight something, you want to get angry, you, you, or, or uh, you want to run from it. Either way, you're not in the right frame of mind to communicate. Remember, when you are not positive, you're negative. When you're in the fight or flight mode, that's your survival skill. So really, it's your left brain that completely takes over. When you're in a life-threatening situation, which your brain subconsciously thinks it is, then it shuts off the right side. It says, don't be creative. Don't mess around. Don't give me colors and music. I need to do calculations here to save this person's life. So really, staying positive means keeping that communication between the left side and the right side of your brain open. Opposite thinking. You heard me mention that before when George Carlin uh, said his little comedy bit. Think opposite. Look at it and say exactly the opposite. Uh, for example, I have a couple of granddaughters that I that come over uh, to Phoenix and we hang out, and I'm always messing with their heads. I love it. For example, they say, "Hey, Papa, can I go swimming?" I said, "Yes, absolutely, go swimming, but I don't want you to get wet." And then they think for a second. They say, "Wait a minute, how how can I not get wet?" And then I say, well, you, what you got to do is you got to swim between the water. If you can do that, you won't get wet. And then they think for a second, you can't do that. I said, yeah, maybe you can't. I said, but I know how we can do it. If we take dry ice and we melt it, you can swim and not get wet. And then they think for a minute and then they just go out and swim because they know that I'm just messing with their heads. But it's always about this opposite thinking. And that's where a lot of the solutions lie. It's it's in those that opposite way of looking at things, looking at it from, from the back. Now, EST strategy, um, it's not the EST that you think where they lock you in a hotel room and you can't go to the bathroom for three days and you have to fall over backwards and hope that somebody catches you. That's not what I'm talking about. But EST strategy, I want you to type in EST strategy in uh, the internet. This is a homework assignment because I don't have time to teach it to you, but it's really cool and it's valuable. So go look at that. If you want to pause the video, that's cool. If you want to wait to the end of the video, that's okay. Make a note of it so you don't forget. But that's another great way to get your, your right brain uh, um, motivated. Now, the five whys. you got to love this five whys. If, you, if you've ever had kids or if you have grandkids or if you know any kids or you hang out at schoolyards, you know, the, the five whys, the kids always use that. For example, um, Daddy, why is it raining? Well, it's raining because the clouds fill up with water and it falls out. Why? Well, because the sun evaporates the water and the water goes up in the sky and makes clouds and that's why the clouds get heavy. Why? Well, because when water gets warm, it changes from a liquid to a to a gas, a vapor, and it goes up in why? Well, and the kids and then it'll get to about five levels and then either you'll strangle them threaten to strangle them or they'll just give up but the thing is is that with the five whys is that you can really get to the root of a problem um, I mean you know for example if you've got a problem that's happening at work ask why do you have that problem and then answer it and then say why is that well because of this why well because of that and if once you get to the fifth level you'll usually end up stopping there it's really weird how this works and now you can say can I fix that and when you get to that point, you can fix it because you're at, at this root level that something really can be fixed. Now, back it out. If I could fix that, then would that fix this? Yes. Well, if I could fix this and this, would that fix this? Well, yeah. And then you f back it all the way right out and you've solved your problem. Not always, but it works. You'll be surprised. And it's kind of fun. Again, uh, do it play this with someone else who's familiar with whatever problem you're trying to solve. And then the other one is alternate nostril breathing. And I thought that this was kind of wacky when I first heard it. And I was apprehensive to try it, but I tried it and it actually worked. And what the deal is, put your finger over one nostril and compress it so that you can only breathe out of the other. And breathe in. I want you to do it 10 times. Breathe in as far and hard as you can. And when you think you can't breathe anymore, get it just a little bit more just suck in a little bit more air and hold it hold it hold it as long as you can and then let it out let it out let it out and when you think it's all out push more out keep going keep going keep going until there's nothing left hold it as long as you can and then breathe in and do the same thing as hard as you can breathe in add more and more, more do that 10 times switch nostrils do it with the other nostril or just switch back and forth between nostrils 
you know what happens? Well, first of all, you get a build up of CO2 in your brain and it makes you a little lightheaded. And that actually helps a little bit, believe it or not. Don't do it to the point where you pass out and slap your head on the desk. <laughs> but it really does relax you. Um, and I think it's because of a build up of CO2. However, when you start breathing normally, you're relaxed, you're communicative, uh, your left brain, your right brain are talking better, uh, and you're a lot more creative. And then really what we're talking about also is just having fun. Fun helps you stay positive. Have some fun. Do something that's fun. I'm going to give you examples here. Uh, listen to some music. Try to not listen to music with a lot of words or a heavy beat. Because I don't want you in your head going, because if you're doing that, what side of the brain is doing that? What side is calculating the rhythm? Even though it's music, it's the left side. You're not writing the music. You're just listening to it. So the left side is going to calculate that bass uh, and that rhythm. And if you're using words, remember words, left side, analytical. We want to open up the right side. We want to just hear instrumentals, just music. Just go with me on this. Trust me. And the main thing is, is to relax and slow down. Just take it easy. Have some fun and relax. Because unless you're positive, unless you're staying positive, uh, you're not going to uh, be creative. Okay, inspiration. Yeah, you, you didn't see things. We were hopping between screens. Okay, inspiration. Uh, I love this. This, I think, really defines creativity, and, and it totally defines uh, this whole concept of being inspired. When Michelangelo was asked how he created the masterpiece David, uh, which he did in about 1504, and it's located in Florence, Italy, um, here's his answer. He started with a piece of solid marble rock, and when he asked how he created this unbelievable masterpiece, he said, I simply chipped away everything that wasn't David. Is that amazing? Think about that. He, in his mind, knew what it was should look like right down to the, the smallest detail. He knew exactly what it should look like. And he simply chipped away everything that wasn't supposed to be there. And that's how you're going to solve some of your problems, is to subconsciously know what's supposed to be there and simply remove everything else. i got to love that. I mean, isn't that amazing? Now, 20 ways to deal with stress without leaving your desk. This is right at your desk, and most of these you can do without actually getting fired. Uh, one way is iPod. Stick in your iPod, listen to some music, get rid of your stress, get positive. Again, try to stay away from music with words, but that's okay if not. Uh, the iPod is a great way to do uh, play solitaire. You know, play a couple of games of solitaire. Change your mind. Change the way you're thinking. Um, you know, be careful you don't get fired. I mean, if you're not allowed to play solitaire at work, don't do that. Uh, but it's a good way to relax. Uh, look at pictures of your family. In my case, that's going to stress me out because if you knew my family... No, I'm just kidding. Um, if that makes you calm, then look at pictures of your family. If it doesn't, then look at pictures of someone else's kids. Um, and then the deep breathing exercises works. Hold it in, hold it in, let it out, let it out. Positive affirmations, calisthenics jokes, silly putty. I love silly putty. I got silly putty in my desk. I got it in my truck, uh, in my Escalade. Uh, I keep it in the console so that if I'm stuck in bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic, I just kind of play with the silly putty. I squeeze one hand, I squeeze the other hand, and it passes time. It reduces stress. Coloring. If you don't think coloring is relaxing, next time you go out to dinner, ask the, the hostess or the waitress, do you have the little crayons and the placemat for kids? Almost every restaurant does. And while you're waiting for your order and you're with whomever you're with, color and see how relaxing it is. I mean, and do a nice job and, and stay with inside the lines. Or just simply grab a book and just read for a few minutes. Something that you enjoy. Get away from the trade journals and the business books, please. Do something that you enjoy. Poetry, comics, quotes, fun. Write in your journal. If you, if you have a journal, write something in your journal. If not, it's a perfect time to take a break and write your blog. Write your blog. Did I say write your blog? Yes, write your blog. Uh, this is extreme digital marketing. Or take a power nap if you can get away with it. You know, 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes in the afternoon uh, is totally refreshing. Again, make sure that you got permission so you don't come back with a pink slip, scotch tape to your head. Self-massage. I'm going to leave that up to your own imagination. Uh, Scooby snacks. Uh, surfing the web. Call your family. Uh, meditate. Just sing out loud. The main thing is, is, is get in touch with the inner child. Relax. Have some fun. Do something that reduces stress. Open up that communication between the right and left brain. Which leads us to 
number one thing that you can do celebrate your eternal child uh, yes this is an actual class picture of me I think I think it's second grade if I'm not mistaken and it'll put me about seven so I'm gonna want you to try to guess which one of uh, the children is me I'll give you a hint I'm center back row and be a child there's uh, some statistics that show that a five-year-old is 98 percent more creative than a 40-year-old a five-year-old is 98 percent more creative than a four-year-old a uh, 40-year-old I mean where to go where to go why were we so creative and let me tell you if you've ever had teens or you remember being a teen you're gonna know how creative I mean there is nothing more creative than a teen I mean Anytime you ask them, you know, where you've been, what have you been up to, how come there's a dent in the car, how come you're late, you see how creative teens are. But somewhere between there and here, we've lost that creativity. So what can you do to try to get some of that creativity back? Read children's books. Go online. Go buy one. Pull one out of the closet. If you have kids, for goodness sakes, read one to your kids. It, not only do kids enjoy it, but you enjoy it too. Go play a video game. Again, there's a ton of them online. Um, go see Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. You know, just watch a kid's movie that's kind of entertaining. And there's a lot of really great innuendos, in, in, by the way, in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Or Shrek, that's another one. A lot of adult innuendo, I love it. Or go to the playground, go ride a swing. Circus or zoo, roller skate, coloring books. Um, create and eat your own recipe. Make something up. Uh, if you like getting greeting cards for your birthday or anniversary, if you like greeting cards, well, you know what? Go spend a half hour and just read greeting cards. I mean, geez, you, you probably need to be sedated by that point because uh, there's aisles of them. A nap. Hang out at the mall and people watch. Etch-a-sketch, Rubik's Cube, hide-and-go-seek, Candyland, Twister, uh, skipping, walking, singing, dance. I mean, whatever it takes, just be, just do something that makes you happy. Watch the clouds. Number two, make it a habit of carrying a pen and paper with you at all times. And I'm serious about that. I have a yellow sticky on my nightstand. I have a yellow sticky in my console of my uh, tr uh, Escalade. I've got yellow stickies all over my office with pens next to them. Anytime I get a good idea, I want to be able to capture that idea. I want to record it. And cherish your doodles. Look at your doodles. No, not those. I mean the kind that when you're on the phone or doing something on the web and you're making little pictures you know what because that's your right brain coming out isn't it there's some creativity that's pouring out and you're not controlling it so see what your doodles are telling you I mean yeah believe it or not <laughs> make up lyrics and songs about your problems I do that all the time wife thinks I've lost my mind but it keeps me happy keeps me focused keeps me uh, creative and stop asking questions that that result in a yes or no too often, whenever we're trying to solve a problem, we ask our questions, and then the answer is yes and no. Bad move. Because what happens is that ends, a yes or no answer ends the line of questioning. It stops the process. Think about that. Um, are we the best at what we do? No. Do we have the largest market share? No. I can't proceed. You, you put up a wall. What if you said... In what ways can we reach new segments of our market? Well, that's not a yes or no. And then that's going to open up a whole line of questioning. What if uh, you asked, how can we increase our response rates? Opens up a whole line of questionings. How can we increase our customer retention levels to 98%? Opens up all these questions. Convergent, divergent thinking. Convergent, divergent thinking don't have time to get in this write down these words convergent divergent thinking go look at them on the internet either pause the video or better yet listen through the rest of the video and go out and get those uh, those terminologies and one of the negative uh, present uh, questions that really make me crazy is have you ever been in a store and have somebody walk up and say to the sales clerk you don't carry these do you and when someone says you don't have this do you I always say no which is a contradiction because I'm ending it by raising the end of the sentence, raising the inflection. No. And they go, huh? And I said, no. Like it's a question. And I said, and then they usually say, well, what do you mean? I said, well, you just told me that I don't have these, but in fact I do. Oh, well, and then, and then of course the, their mind, their head catches fire and smoke comes out of their ears because they're really not sure what just took place. Don't do that. Don't be negative. Don't make the assumptions. Um, you don't carry these, do you? 
Oh my gosh, that makes me crazy. Don't do that. Be positive all the time. Transform problems into positive action statements. Yes, we are number three, and we can be number two in 12 months. I like this sentence because, it yeah, it admits that you're number three. But, yeah, you can be number two. That's a great thing about this country. You can always be number two and number one if you want to be and if you work hard and you figure out how to do it. But the other thing I like about this sentence is, is that it says in 12 months. I like that because that puts a time frame on it. That means that not only do we have to come up with these ideas, we have to implement them, but we also have to do it within 12 months. I think that's a really powerful statement. Yes, we are smaller than our competitor and we can create lucrative niche markets better than they can. Okay, we're faster on our feet. We're more agile. Uh, we're more aggressive. We don't have the red tape. I was just working with two two different companies. One was a large one, one was a small one. They were in both exactly the same space. And you know what the smaller one that's gaining market share really fast, they said exactly that. We're smaller, we're agile, we're, we don't have to worry about uh, Securities Exchange Commission because we're not a publicly traded company. We can make decisions quickly, we can implement them quickly. Man, recognize that. So stay positive, create action statements that are positive. And remove barriers. As I said earlier, play what if. What if you had all the time and all the money and all the resources that you could ever want? Nothing was a restriction. What would your solution look like? Well, there's a solution. Okay, it's not a practical solution because you don't have unlimited resources, but it's a solution. It works. Okay, so now you've defined your problem where you are today. You defined it without any restrictions at all. Let's start adding some of the restrictions and see how that solution could change and then see how we can change the restrictions because somewhere in there there's a compromise between total solution and your restrictions. Make sense? I bought some powdered water but I don't know what to add. <laughs> I love this guy. That was Stephen Wright. Bought some powdered water but he doesn't know what to add. And begin with the end in mind. Uh, Stephen Covey teaches in the use of seven habits of highly effective people to visualize the end and work backwards. And honestly, this tr and the secret is all about that. I mean, if you're familiar with the secret, I mean, Esther is just it, it, absolutely amazing. I love it. And I believe in it. I, and I've been doing it decades before the secret ever came out. Or even Stephen Covey did his books and tapes. And let me give you an example. If you look at the top right-hand corner, that's an example of one of the book covers that I did. Uh, about 10 years ago, I was not a published author. I've never had never written a book. Uh, I was always told that I was a good writer and I should write, write a book. I had all of these incredible presentations uh, that you're seeing on extreme digital marketing and all these insights and all these experiences, but I didn't have a book. And nowadays, you know, with uh, desktop publishing and with uh, self-publishing, you, you get a better chance of really getting struck by lightning while you win the lottery uh, than you have of becoming a published author. It's very, very difficult. Everybody wants to be one. So what I did was is I created a cover of a book, my very first book that I wanted to create. And I just created, it was a mock-up. It was a fake cover. And I did the back cover too. And if you notice in that one, that's a fake back cover. And what you'll see on the left part of the top image is a barcode. I went so far as to scan a barcode off of an actual book so that my fake cover looked exactly like a real cover of a book. Now let me tell you what happened. I took that and I printed it out in glossy stock and I put it up on my refrigerator. This is a true story. And it just sat on my refrigerator for about a week. And this one uh, morning, uh, a friend of mine who was a published author, he had published 14 books in his career. He was a very prolific writer. Um, he, he called me up to ask me a business favor and we'd been friends for quite a while so what happened was is that while I was talking to him I went and got a cup of coffee in my kitchen because I work out of a home office and I went to get the milk to pour in the coffee and I reached for the refrigerator door and I saw this f fake faux cover and all of a sudden it dawned on me that this guy had written 14 books and he owed me a favor anyway at this point so I said to him I said hey can you introduce me please to your publisher to your editor and he said sure why not you got an idea for a book I said matter of fact I do so then he came back and said well why don't I work with you on doing the outline so that it's in the format that they're comfortable with so that they can take it right into blue sky which is part of the process of deciding whether they're going to get the book and he says and uh, you know I owe you a favor anyway so sure so we worked on the outline we submitted it and the book was accepted 
bang, now I'm a nationally published author. And that was with, uh, uh, internationally published actually, it was with Pearson uh, Publishing and uh, the cover was Q. So I actually came up with my first book. And I've done this time and time again. Let me give you another practical example. Have you ever played golf? Do you think about the 140 muscle movements that it takes to hit the ball uh, successfully down the center of the fairway? Or do you line up, take everything else out of your mind, and actually visualize, see the ball going down the center of the fairway, and then swing? Right. That's what you do. That's what you're taught to do. Because if you see the end, your body will do all of the little bits and pieces necessary to fulfill that vision. Same thing as if you're hitting a baseball. Do you watch the pitcher? Do you watch the ball? Do you watch the crowds? Are you looking at the bat? you watching your feet? No, you're visualizing the ball flying up nice and high out to uh, center field. Exactly. When you, um, anything, just think about it. You look at the end and then your body does what's necessary. Your mind does what's necessary to get you to that point. So sometimes that, you know, it really does work and it's worked a lot of times for me. That's why it's in this presentation. Ask bizarre, unexpected questions to rattle your own cage. Ask some really weird questions about your problem. Now, every one of these that you see here, truly and honestly, are weird questions that I asked myself one time and actually created. What if you spoke to a computer and it did what you asked? I did that. I was the first to do voice recognition. It goes all the way back to the late 70s uh, and early 80s when I implemented it. I actually had a computer that would listen to what I said and do it. Uh, open a file, close a file, type the words. Um, it was pretty scary. Nowadays, it's kind of commonplace. But you know what? 30 years ago, it was a big deal, and I was the first to do that. Then I taught the computer. I gave it the ability to talk back to me. I can talk to it, and it spoke back to me. Again, in the late, 80, uh, late 70s, early 80s, that was a big deal for computers when the Apple II was the most sophisticated computer on the planet. So ask those kinds of questions. What if you control the mouse just by moving your head? Your head goes side to side, the mouse goes side to side. And what if you had a little straw, it, it was actually it was a dentist saliva sucker tube hooked to a pressure sensitive switch that when you moved your head around you could just puff on this little tube and it would activate a mouse button. You can control a computer just by using your head with no arms. And I actually had a woman without arms who could type 48 words a minute. What if you could push a button and the computer would speak for you? What if you had cancer of the larynx? What if you had multiple sclerosis, muscular dystrophy, um, cerebral palsy, and you couldn't speak? What if? Well, I created that. What if you sipped on a straw and can turn on a light? Just sipping on a little straw that could turn a light on and off, adjust your air conditioning, lock and unlock a door, turn on the television, change the channels. I was the first to do that as well back in the 80s. What if you could puff on a straw and control a hospital bed? What if you can send, and by the way, uh, those are part of the 18 inventions that I created by asking these questions that are part of the permanent collection of the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. Also, 30,000 of my personal records are part of the permanent collection of the Smithsonian. So, you know, going from these questions to reality, it's possible. What if you could send a virtual toy over the Internet? What if I could distribute an actual physical toy that you can play with, but I can send it over the Internet? Um, actually, I did that too, and I just was recently awarded my third patent on that process in three-dimensional internet advertising. So you know what? Asking bizarre, unexpected questions shakes you up a bit. This is important. Number eight, give yourself impossible deadlines. You have to give yourself deadlines. You know what happens if you assign action items to people but don't give deadlines. None of them will get done. If you don't set the time for the next meeting, the meeting will never take place. If you want to be forced subconsciously, you've got to set a deadline. So give yourself a de an impossible deadline. It's better to reschedule your deadline and eventually come up with a solution than never set a deadline and never come up with a solution. It's better to reschedule. So do that for everybody, for action items, for meetings, for everything. Set that time frame. Uh, go on a field trip. You can do it alone or you can take your team. Go visit your competition. If they're brick and mortar, that's really easy. If they're uh, just clicks, if they're not, if they're bricks, not, not bricks, but clicks, 
Go buy one of their products. See what the process is. See what they're doing. Write ten thing down. Write down ten things that they're doing right. What do you like about their product? What do you like about their process? What can you incorporate? Test every phase from hold time to return policies to uh, privacy policies, guarantees, warranties, customer service, pricing, packaging, ship times, all of it. Take a look at everything that they're doing, and be inspired by the work that they've done. And be your own mystery shopper. Do this to your own company. When was the last time you actually bought one of your own products? Trust me, unless you've gone through the buying process, if you're an internet company, if you just do e-commerce, how easy and intuitive is your shopping cart solution? When we implemented our shopping cart the first time, we had no idea how abysmal. It wasn't until I created this slide that I said, I better go do that with mine. And I found that it was unintuitive, complicated. And what happened was is we were losing what turned out to be almost 20% of our customers were bailing. Even after they made a decision to buy our product, our shopping cart was so bad that 20% of our customers would leave. Nobody ever told us that there was a problem. They just left, and they probably bought from the competition. By fixing the shopping cart, we knew that it was 20% because we saw almost instantly a 20% increase in sales. Is that amazing? Now, I'm going to go through a couple of these. I'm going to go through these because I think that they're absolutely amazing uh, That how ignorant huge companies can be. Don't make these mistakes. Wake up, right brain. Uh, here's number one. As of tomorrow, employees will only be able to access the building using individual security cards. Pictures will be taken next Wednesday, and employees will receive their cards in two weeks. I got nothing. That was actually Fred Dallas at uh, Microsoft. Number two. Uh, what I need is a specific list of unknown problems we will encounter. And that was from Likes Lines Shipping. Um, okay, if you can do that, please uh, email me with that process because that would be very important. Number three, email is not to be used to pass on information or data. It should only be used for company business. Wow, the accounting manager at, at Electric Boat Company. Number four, this project is so important that we can't let things that are more important interfere with it. <laughs> Advertising marketing manager for United Parcel Service. These are real, by the way. They're, they're not made up. These are documented. Number five, doing it right is no excuse for not meeting the schedule. No one will believe that you solved the problem in one day. We've been working on it for months. Now go act busy for a few weeks, and I'll let you know when it's time to tell them. And that really was the R&D supervisor for Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing. That's 3M Corporation. 3M, the most innovative, one of the most innovative companies in America. Uh, Tom Peters featured it on his In Search of Excellence as being one of the most innovative companies in the world. And that's the kind of talk that they're having behind the <laughs> screen doors. Um, number six, my boss spent the entire weekend retyping a 25-page proposal that only needed a few corrections. She claimed the disk I gave her was damaged so she couldn't edit it. The disk I gave her was right protected. Remember the little three and a half inch floppies with the right protect on them? Yeah, but even funnier, that was the CEO of Dell Computers. She thought the disk was damaged because of the right protect tab. And a quote from the boss, teamwork is a lot of people doing what I say. How many times have you heard that or something like it? That was a marketing exec uh, executive at Citrix Corp. Number eight, how about Friday? My sister passed away and her funeral was scheduled for Monday. When I told my boss, he said that she died, so I would have to miss the busiest day, uh, work day of the year. Uh, when Then he asked me if I could change her, her burial to Friday. He said that would be better for me. <laughs> Shipping executive at FTD Florist. Number nine, we know the communication is a problem, but the company is not going to discuss it with employees. What? We know that communication is a problem, but we're not going to discuss it with the employees. And that was a supervisor of all companies, at and <laughs> Isn't that great? And number 10, we recently received a memo from senior management saying, this is to inform you that a memo will be issued today regarding the subject mentioned above. What? <laughs> and of course, that can only have been sent from uh, legal affairs in Microsoft. So, you know what? Be creative. Uh, I'm not going to read these, but I want to touch on some of the highlights. I love understanding uh, um, where information comes from. Uh, heavier than air, let me read these. Heavier than air flying machines are impossible. That was Lord Kelvin. Uh, he was the president of the Royal Society in Cambridge. The, it, airplanes are impossible. Um, I think uh, I, th <laughs> I think there is a world market for maybe only five computers. 
That was Thomas Watson, the chairman of IBM, in 1943. He was convinced that there would never be more than five computers in the world. Next quote. There's no reason for any individual to have a computer in their home. I was the president of digital equipment. The telephone has too many shortcomings to be seriously considered as a means of communication. The device is inherently of no value to us. That was Western Union. How do you like those apples, Western Union? Airplanes are interesting toys, but of no military value. The wireless music box has no imaginable commercial value. Who would pay for a message sent to nobody in particular? Gotta love that. Uh, that was radio, by the way, when they were trying to find uh, investment. Everything that can be invented has been invented. And that was the commissioner of the patent office in 1899. And then the last one is, who the hell wants to hear actors talk? That was uh, Harry Warner, one of the original Warner brothers. Wow, is that bad? Now, I want you to look at these. When I'm, when I'm done talking, pause and read through these. Because these are amazing mistakes that were made that actually turned out to be some of the greatest inventions that we know today. So I'm going to stop talking here in a second. I want you to pause. Then I want you to read these two. One is about the electric flower pot and Lionel, Joshua Lionel uh, Cohen. Joshua Lionel Cohen. But I want you to focus on his last name. Uh, also, or his middle name. Also, Harley Proctor. Uh, is a famous name that you probably will recognize when he accidentally overturned a, a vat of soap. Um, okay, so now's the time to hit pause. Ready? Hit pause, read these, and then hit restart. Okay, um, also, King Gillette, and no, he wasn't royalty. His first name actually was King, like the uh, the the dog. Okay, but he had this idea for uh, creating a razor blade that you throw away and that you wouldn't have to sharpen. Yeah, well, the rest is history. And Robert Cheeseboro, you got to love this. You probably never heard of him. He was a chemist, uh, actually invented petroleum jelly. Now, you can read these, you can pause, but I want to tell you about 3M's glue, union carbides, ethyl glycol, and warehouses, wood chips. Also, mistakes. 3M was famous for commercial adhesives. They could make glues that would stick anything to anything and would never come apart. Their glue was so good that if you glued two pieces of wood together that the fibers of the wood would actually tear before the glue joint would break and that's what they were famous for and this one scientist came up with this glue that he was using on paper but the glue was lousy it would make the paper stick to the paper but when you went to tear it apart it would come apart and not tear the fibers of the paper it wouldn't damage either one of the two pieces of paper so he got in trouble he got yelled at why you spend all this money to make crappy glue but he said, no. He says, I made it on purpose because it could be useful. And he, they, they, they told him, don't work on it. No, you can't. He went ahead on his own time and created these little square pieces, pads, that had this glue on it so that you can stick notes on top of paper. And then it would stick semi-permanently, but when you tore them off, you didn't damage the paper below. And he ended up sending these little notes. He created them. He sent them to the secretary for the, of the top executives at 3M, the secretaries. And they were so excited about it that when they ran out, they contacted purchasing and demanded more of these because the CEO and the vice presidents were using them and they were using them, but they didn't exist. Finally, he admitted that he did it on his own time because he was told not to do it. Those are post-it notes. Union Carbide is one of the largest producers of different kinds of chemicals. They make chemicals for manufacturing. And in one of the processes, in, the, in this process of making a certain chemical that they were selling, there was this byproduct, this junk that came out of the process that they had to throw away. But they couldn't dump it in the ground. They couldn't dump it in the river. It was poisonous. They, and they really didn't know what to do with it. And they were ending up with tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of gallons of this ethyl glycol. And when they asked... Uh, what are we going to do with this? The scientist says, I don't know. Uh, we can't burn it. We can't bury it. We can't dump it in the water. We, we can't shoot it into outer space. It doesn't freeze. It do and the guy says, what? He goes, yeah, it doesn't even freeze. Well, that became antifreeze. And it's one of the largest products that Union Carbide to this day sells, ethyl glycol. And it was a junk spinoff product. Warehouser is another one. In their milling process, they ended up with these gigantic piles of chips. I mean, mountain size three, four, five stories tall, acres across, and they didn't know what to do with it. Somebody said, what if you mix them with some glue and press them into sheets? 
Now, well, guess what? Press board. We make everything from powdered press board out of sawdust to plywood type press board out of these wood chips. So they took a garbage product that they were hauling to the landfill, and now we actually sell more press board materials than we do plywoods and other types of um, non manufactured woods. So get creative. Now, I'm not going to read this either. This has to do with um, uh, Wayne Dyer. Uh, he did something called The Power of Intention. And he talks about being inspirited. What inspiration comes from the word inspirited. It comes from the Greek. And it means inspirited or inspiritu. And what, that, what the Greeks believed is that when you had a moment of inspiration, that the gods, the spirits, actually touched your head and gave you that idea, that very moment, that spark of inspiration. I want you to hit pause as soon as I'm done talking. I want you to read this because I think it's inspirational. Okay, well, I hope you got something out of this presentation. I do, every time I do the presentation, I'm always thinking of new things that I can apply these rules to because I'll be honest with you, sometimes I forget and I shouldn't uh, forget because, um, you know, I write this stuff and I practice it. Uh, but I get new stuff out of it every time I present it. So um, thank you for your time. I enjoyed it. I hope you did get something out of it. So uh, take a look at some of the other creative marketing because extreme digital marketing is really creative marketing as well. The more creative you are, the more successful and the better competitive advantage you're going to have, better bottom line you're going to have. So this has been um, the uh, Hey Right Brain Wake Up. And my name is Lon Safko. I am the author of the Social Media Bible. And I'm coming to you from Extreme Digital Marketing.